You just finished watching our CBSN original Priced Out, LA's Hidden Homeless, about the dire lack of affordable housing in the city. But the issue is not unique to Los Angeles. The United States is one of the world's wealthiest countries with one of the worst inequality problems. We wanted to find out why. For that, I sat down with Matthew Desmond. He is a sociology professor at Princeton and author of the book Evicted, Poverty and Profit in the American City. He chronicles what he calls, quote, a vicious cycle that deepens our country's vast inequality. When we think about homelessness, we often don't consider the role that eviction plays and how once you are evicted, it can lead to a cycle of homelessness. Can you explain how that works? Sure. I mean, eviction causes loss. You lose your home, but often lose your stuff. Your kids lose your school. You lose your community and neighbors. It takes a good amount of time and money to build up a home, and eviction can just erase all that. An eviction comes with this mark, goes to the court system, and many landlords say no. So that means people, after they're evicted, are pushed into homelessness, and then they're pushed into worse housing and worse neighborhoods after their eviction happens. It stays on their record, then. It follows you around. That's right. Mm -hmm. It seems as if and maybe this is my, you know, perception and maybe this isn't the truth, but it seems as if we're hearing more and more stories of eviction. Is it easier to get evicted these days than it was in the past? There used to be a time where eviction was rare and scandalous. It drew crowds. People protested eviction. And we've gone from that place in America to a place where if you're a low income person, you've grown really used to, you know, the rumble of the trucks in the morning and effects lining the curb. Eviction is completely overturning low income families and schools and communities. And what historical uh, events or economic events played a role in this? Did the recession of 2007, 2008 make things worse? The recession absolutely played a role, but for many people facing eviction, they've faced a, a recession before the housing crisis, after the housing crisis. For some, it's been a lifetime of recession-like conditions. Um, what we're in is the middle of an enormous housing crisis, one of the worst our country has ever seen. Rents and utility costs have gone up, incomes for Americans have been flat, and the federal government hasn't bridged the gap. And so we've reached a point where the majority of poor renting families are now spending most of their income on housing costs. And yet all the economic indicators right now tell us that the economy is booming, that right. there's low unemployment, right. you know, the economy is growing, jobs for everyone. Right. So what's going on? Where's the disconnect? Right. There's the economy, then there's the economy. <laughs> there's the economy in terms of the S&P and stock market and Wall Street. And then there's the economy for regular Americans and wages. And if you're living in a home headed by someone with a high school education or less, your income has been very flat over the last 20 years. In some areas of the country, it's fallen in real terms. And as that has happened, rents and utilities have gone up. Here's one statistic. Between 1995 and today, median rent, adjusting for inflation, has increased over 70% America, in America. So imagine, you know, there's this closing gap between what many families are bringing in and what they have to pay for just basic shelter today. And you focused on Milwaukee in your yeah. book. Does eviction, the process of eviction, vary from city to city? It does. So I wrote a book about Milwaukee. But then I have formed a research team at Princeton called the Eviction Lab, and we've tried to build the nation's first ever national database of eviction. The federal government doesn't collect this data, so we thought, let's try. And so we've published that data, and we can map, and we can answer that question for the very first time. And what we're learning is that Milwaukee's not even in the top 50 highest evicting cities. Who's up there? Richmond, Virginia's there, one in nine renter homes evicted every year. Tulsa, Oklahoma, Albuquerque, New Mexico, one in 21. Renter homes evicted every year. Who's talking about Tulsa and Albuquerque when it comes to the housing crisis? We absolutely should be. And what's to account for the variation? Do some cities simply have tougher laws on the books, making it harder for landlords to evict tenants? We're still trying to get to that question, but it does seem the law matters. Little mm -hmm. things, you know, how much it costs to evict someone, how long you have to wait to file an eviction, that seems to matter very much. But one thing that's striking to me is that in some hot, very expensive markets that we talk about a lot in the media, sure, there is a housing crisis in LA and San Francisco and New York City, but there's also a housing crisis in rural America, in low cost cities in the South and in the Midwest. This is a nationwide problem. Let's talk about some of the misperceptions about people who become homeless, who are evicted. I mean, often there is this idea that, well, these people didn't work hard enough, they didn't manage their money properly, they weren't responsible. So it's their fault that they no longer have a home. Mm -hmm. Is that a misperception? 
You know, I think that uh, when I hear something like that, I think of the people that I've met in my reporting and research, you know, and I'm thinking of a woman I've met named Vanessa Sullivan. Uh, she was a home health aide trying to raise three kids as a single mom. She was living in Trenton, New Jersey, and she was part of the working homeless, this new phrase that we have now about people that are working full time or close to full time and still can't afford a roof over their head. So we might say from a position of security or privilege, I've worked really hard to get where I am. But Vanessa's worked really hard to get where she is, too. So I don't think that's the full story. So let me expand the conversation past housing just for a moment, yeah. since you study inequality. And that's a big issue going into the 2020 election. And yeah. a lot of Democrats have ideas about this, including higher taxes on, on the wealthy to fund some of these programs that you're talking about. Is that something that you think would make sense? So in the housing world, we have a social policy that's pretty upside down. And so... Um, the money that we spend on homeowner tax subsidies, especially the mortgage interest deduction, that far, far outpaces direct housing assistance to the needy. A phenomenon here in New York that I'm sure takes place in cities all around the country is that a lower income neighborhood suddenly becomes trendy, wealthier people move in, the people who lived there originally can no longer afford the rent. Right. So is gentrification part of the problem? It is part of the problem. It's not where most evictions happen though. You know, most evictions nationwide are happening in non-gentrifying, poor segregated neighborhoods. Well, even there, people can't afford uh, the roof over their head. So why, right? Why is that? And so when I lived in Milwaukee, for example, I was living in one of the poorest neighborhoods in the city. I was only paying $50 less than people living in the middle class neighborhoods of the city. And so you p get a lot less house, you get a lot more crime and poverty in your neighborhood, but you don't pay that much less. How does that work? The market factors there are confusing to me because right. there's got to be some supply and demand when it right. comes to housing, correct? So there are some cities like New York and Seattle where there's a supply crunch, but there are a lot of cities where they do have a lot of supply. But people living in the poor neighborhoods are kind of stuck there. They're excluded from... Uh, homeownership on account of their credit or their income or their poverty. They're often excluded from living outside of segregated neighborhoods because of the racial discrimination. And so they kind of are kind of cordoned off into a certain sector of the city and that produces kind of the opportunity to exploit. Is that the short-sightedness that we're talking about? It takes a little bit extra effort to see past your own situation? I think that's, that's part of it. And the way we talk about poverty in America, we don't take personal responsibility for it. The non-poor people. If we're a little bit conservative, we talk about people's work ethic or family values maybe. And if we're liberal, we talk about the safety net or education. And those two ways of talking about inequality let us all off the hook. Mm. It's as if there's this enormous problem in the United States. One in five kids don't have enough money coming in to afford basic necessities in their so house. So one in five children in America live That's in right. poverty. Yes. And That's so, incredible for the wealthiest country in the world. That's shameful for the wealthiest country in the world.